said it's showtime. And let's see here. Okay, so uh, it looks like we are live. And we are live, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, let's see here. So I am here with Shashi of the germ and we were just trying to debug our setup a little bit. Shashi, can you say something? Let's see if we can hear you. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Let's see. Shashi? Hello? Hey, great. OK, yeah. I can hear you. OK. OK, perfect. So yeah, Shashi, I think we can all hear you. OK. OK, so uh, let me introduce uh, uh, myself and our guest here. So guys, hello, I am Glenn Jocker. I am uh, the founder of Ultralytics, uh, which I started a while ago, uh, but probably better known as uh, one of the authors of the YOLO models that have gotten really popular these days. And we're here with Shashi. Uh, I'm scared to pronounce your last name, uh, but he is the co-founder of Digirum, and Digirum is a startup that has been making great strides uh, in the hardware space helping get these models at uh, runnable speeds on edge devices, which is really important. So Shashi, do you wanna say a word or two about yourself to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shashi. I am one of the founders of Digiram. Uh, we are a hardware company making an AI uh, hardware accelerator for edge workloads. And we are very excited to share what we have been doing we have been working with YOLO models for quite a while now, starting with YOLO v5, and now we are at uh, YOLO v8. So would like to share our progress with the community. OK, great. Yeah, so uh, yeah, why don't we let me, I guess, take a step back and provide some context here. So. I'll give a bit of story about how I got uh, into ML and where I got into the export game. So when I first started working on YOLO models, I was uh, mostly worried about inference and training. So I started working mostly on porting over darknet architectures over into Python, into PyTorch. Um, the easiest way that I could do that was on the inference side. So I exported over uh, PyTorch inference first and I was able to compare my outputs to darknet models, which is, of course, the framework created by Joseph Redmond, the original author of YOLO. And this is how I uh, kind of made my first steps. And once I got that completed, I had to replicate the training, which was uh, another story. It was much more difficult. Um, but then once that was complete, then I realized that uh, there were different ways that you could actually run inference. And so the default method that most people had been using and that I'd been using was just to take your PyTorch model and uh, just put that into uh, inference mode or uh, turn off the gradients and then just run forward passes. Uh, and that works pretty well if you're a developer when you're running experiments, uh, you know, for most work. But uh, if you're going to be running a lot of images, uh, then it makes sense to invest a bit of effort into exporting these models into a different type of format. And so an interesting thing happens uh, when you when you export a model to a different format, the benefits are typically that it's more optimized for that specific format. Uh, so anytime something becomes more optimized for one specific place, it naturally loses some flexibility and robustness. And so you could think of a PyTorch model. This is how I think of it. I think of a PyTorch model as a, a very kind of broad, generally applicable format. Uh, you can train with it. You can investigate different architectures. You can even build your own models using modules and so on. So it's very flexible. It does a lot of different things. And this makes it super useful, so I like it. Uh, but that means that in a specific, more narrow domain, it is not as optimized as it could be. So since it has to do so many different things, like you can imagine a restaurant that serves like pizzas and sushi and uh, Mexican food, and it's not gonna be as good at each of those things as if it was just dedicated to that. And so this is where the export formats come in. And so much to my surprise, it took me like a year or two to figure this out. Um, but it turns out that a lot of inference is not run in PyTorch. 
Uh, usually people would export to Onyx uh, to run on CPU or to TensorRT to run on GPU. And so this, uh, this really surprised me and I realized, wow, okay, this is something that, that we're not supporting at all. And uh, I really wanted to make things simpler for YOLO and make it easier to actually do what you want to do. And it seemed like people wanted to do these things with the other formats. And so I started working on supporting export formats in YOLO v5. Uh, by that time, it was about a year after launch. So it was about uh, 2021, 2022. And so I became uh, very invested in the export formats. Spent about a year uh, working to get YOLO, working on almost every conceivable format. Now I've got about a dozen formats. And uh, the interesting thing was that it's not really just about exporting the model of that format, because when you do that, uh, you have to make sure that you're getting the same result. And that's important. And so I also spent time making sure that we could validate those exported formats. So uh, I started out with YOLO v5, and now YOLO v8 has carried that on. And it's uh, very unique among the frameworks in that you can export to almost everywhere, such as uh, CoreML, TFLA, TensorRT, OpenVINO by Intel, Onyx, and so on. Uh, and then once you've done that, you can validate also uh, the same model or even just run predictions. And you can make sure you get the same results, the same validation accuracies. And that can give you a nice confidence to go on and deploy that model. So uh, I think I will kind of pass this over to Shashi and he can tell a bit of the backstory about how he got into the optimization game uh, and not just on the software side, but also on the hardware side. So Digirum does not just software, uh, but hardware accelerators too. So they're one of the crop of startups that has popped up to help uh, accelerate and optimize inference on edge devices. So. Uh, Shashi, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, like the format that you started using for deployment and I, I guess where you found a limitation there. Like, I guess you got to some point where you said, hey, this isn't good enough and how you thought you could make it better and uh, what you've done since then. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Glenn, for that uh, very good overview of uh, where the inference and export uh, frameworks come into picture. So basically, we have been when we started out Digirum, uh, YOLO v3 was the kind of the state of the art model. And it was already too big for most of the edge devices, somewhere around 60 million parameters. So we, if you just run in PyTorch in floating point mode, the checkpoint was like 240 megabytes or so. And then, you know, obviously we started looking at uh, quantization and quantization comes with its own challenges. So at that point, uh, one of yeah. the edge devices that was available was the Coral Edge TPU. So people were really trying to see how they can get these type of models to work on edge devices, such as the Coral, uh, just on Intel CPUs, and see how they can actually optimize and get real-time performance. And when we started with YOLO v5, uh, there was a direct port to TF Lite. So there was a parallel branch in which the model could be defined in TF Lite and uh, you could actually export it into TF Lite. So we were relying on that. And um, actually, after our uh, export, we saw a very good performance on HTPU as well as uh, our own hardware. And when YOLO V8 came, we were very excited and uh, started doing the same, uh, but then realized uh, that for the TF Lite formats specifically, uh, including the post-processing in the model definition, so whether you get the TF Lite or the Onyx, uh, having the post-processing, which is basically what we call bounding box decoding, right? So YOLO V8 is anchorless, but it's still, uses a grid-based uh, uh, architecture to find, to decode the bounding boxes. So actually including this mm -hmm. in the post-processing leads to significant uh, performance loss uh, and the way different people solve it differently. So for example, OpenVINO, OpenVINO has very good uh, flexible format. So it can actually uh, allow you to specify some of the layers and say, please do not include this in quantization. So if you see the OpenVINO code, you will realize that they will actually exclude some nodes from quantization. So, and these nodes are typically in the post-processing. 
So the by post processing, we don't mean the non-max suppression, but just the bounding box decoding. But in TF light, unfortunately, uh, there is no support for this kind of mixed precision. So edge devices like uh, Coral Edge TPU do not run mixed precision models. So everything has to be intact. So then we started looking, how can we give everybody the advantage of uh, the speed and accuracy of YOLO V8, but not lose out because it has this one limitation on quantization. And then we realized that uh, all of this is actually coming from um, basically including the bounding box decoding in the in the ONNX or TF light. So we rewrote some part of the export code to essentially expose all the six outputs. So YOLO V8 actually has hmm. uh, six outputs now, three for the bounding box. And boxes. this is because bounding boxes, they have a, a higher dynamic range than than all the other outputs, right? Yes. So, and bounding boxes have their own kind of uh, decoding, right? So you have the DFL layer, uh, you perform the softmax, then you basically convert those 64 uh, output into four uh, bounding box coordinates. So this process of actually having the softmax here is not really good for uh, quantization. So what we have done is actually simply uh, remove this part from the model. Right? So basically say that mm -hmm. running the model yeah, is so, only... So that contrasts all the other outputs, which are sigmoid. So they have a range of zero to one. Yeah. So the class probabilities are okay, uh, but the bounding box coordinates will be way off uh, if you use the quantization because of the softmax type of layers. So our essential, our essential insight was that uh, just take the outputs of these uh, layers as is, and then do everything on the CPU. So of course, this means that if you now look at this new Onyx or TF Lite file, you will be left with these uh, six outputs, and then you have to write quite a bit of code to uh, basically get the output in the format that you want. And this is what we have done. So basically we have made it transparent to the end user such that if you specify while exporting uh, separate outputs equal to true, then it will remember this flag. And when you infer, you also basically give the same separate outputs equal to true flag. Then it will work. The YOLO repository will work uh, exactly the same way as before. Uh, this was one. This was one insight. The second is actually something very closely related to Glenn. What you mentioned. When you are actually deploying this thing in the field, uh, you really need to uh, think about, we really need to think about uh, resources. So people don't want to deploy on edge devices with PyTorch dependency. So during, um, basically, you know, when you have Onyx or TF Lite, they have their own runtimes. But these own runtimes actually don't give you the nice bounding box results that the YOLO uh, repository gives because it still gives you this huge mm -hmm. one uh, 16,128 by 84 or you know 8,400 by 84 output uh, which you still have to do the non-max suppression uh, convert them into bounding boxes and then visualize so the other thing that we did was that build on top of the runtimes and basically make sure that the post processing part which includes the non-max suppression is included in the runtime so that when you just say output is equal to model of input this output you get is not this huge tensor but actually the nicely formatted json with the bounding boxes scores and the class uh, ids that we are used to right so pretty much like how do you uh, get this using Let's say you know just have an OpenVINO runtime or a TF Lite runtime or our own runtime or TensorRT. How do you do all of this such that a model of input will become output that you expect it to be? So that was kind of the second uh, major thing that we have done. And on building on top of this, of course, we wanted to have a framework in which people can develop real-time applications. So that means. Uh, 
run this on cameras, run this on RTSP streams, run this on video files, run this on webcams, right? So, which again, YOLO network, YOLO repository itself supports, right? So you have like a predict stream kind of approach that can take any of uh, these as input. But That's where everybody uh, wants to run their YOLO models. Yeah, but we yeah. want to run, let's say, you know, multiple multiple YOLO models uh, in a either in a series or in parallel. So like one one example, early example that we had from our customers who wanted to use multiple YOLO models in series was um, reading license plate numbers of a car. So, you know, there is no data set that basically annotates both uh, license plates as well as uh, the numbers itself, because this is, you know, too huge of a problem. So you kind of divide into two parts where there is a very good data set that can identify a license plate number. And then given yeah, a license yeah. plate number, it becomes much easier to read. So now you it's, want to- Yeah, the, the scale is too, too different. Yeah, right. So so then we realized that, you know, we actually trained a YOLO model for OCR, right? Uh, in a sense that uh, it actually is pretty good in a sense that in a license plate number, it knows uh, when trained properly, it knows that it has to, not read the state, not uh, get confused with the background and so on, but just read the license plate uh, number, right? So this kind of approach where people use uh, multiple models uh, is one use case that we have built around. And sometimes people also want to use multiple models in parallel. So that means let's say you want to have, uh, you know, let's say just as an example, you want to detect faces and hands, right? you might not actually get a data set in which both of these are un annotated. In fact, we tried um, getting from Google Open Images uh, things that are annotated with face and hand. And what happens is if you look at how the images were annotated, the annotators were given a specific task. They were asked to annotate faces. Right? And then another set of annotators were asked to annotate hands. So the data set itself doesn't really have consistent uh, labeling. So that means if you take an intersection of this, you actually don't get uh, things in which both hands and faces are labeled. So if you try to train on such a model, you will actually end up with very bad performance. So people might find it very easy to actually train for single class and then maybe merge or use them in parallel, right? So how do we get to build mm. applications? Yeah, I've noticed the same actually with Open Images V7. Mm. It's got a lot of classes, but the consistency of the classes um, leave something to be desired. Yes. So we have seen that actually YOLO V8 and YOLO V5 models on a single class are actually extremely accurate, right? So it's like, you know, very, very good. Uh, whenever we show our customers like a starting point of the model, they almost think that, okay, they just need to maybe collect a few more images and then they will be fine. Uh, so in, as opposed to basically something like Coco, which is, you know, 80 classes, very good for demo and so on, but there is too much of variance between the, between the classes, right? So we think that this might be one direction that people will take that whatever, uh, you know, people don't generally have 80 different use cases. So they might have like five or six classes. So they will kind of retrain it for their uh, specific uh, classes. So that's where we are today at. So basically when we started doing this optimization, we realized that uh, this is okay. uh, potentially a very useful tool and, for everybody. Uh, so how would somebody go about getting started with all of this, Shashi? Yeah, so I made a very small presentation. So I'll just quickly go through this. Uh, but most of the time in the session, I want to actually uh, okay. devote it to hands-on demo. And uh, I hope uh, someone has provided the links also. Uh, I'm going to provide the links in my talk, but uh, the idea is to make uh, everybody else who is on the session also run these demos. So we want to make it as easy as possible for people to run the, run the demos by themselves. See. So Shashi, I think if you go to the YouTube link, I think you could probably just drop a comment there, just like where everyone else is leaving comments. Yeah.
Let's see. So, so Urvashi says, how many images would be sufficient for class? Um, it, it really depends on the difficulty, but there's a baseline, you know, we always point to Coco and there they have 10,000 instances per class and about a thousand images per class. So. Okay. So what I wanted to do today was, uh, basically, uh, provide, uh, I think I already provided a lot of overview of what we do, but, uh, uh, formally show some of the uh, products that we have built, but then talk about actually the release of 40 different YOLO V8 models that we are, uh, we have trained and we want to make them available to the community. Uh, then show how you can run inference on these uh, models. So we have put all of these models into a model zoo called Ultralytics V6, which we have made available to public. Uh, you can run in-browser inference. That means no need to uh, basically download any tool. You can just uh, run as is. And um, you can run them in Google Collab. So I'm going to actually show a Collab uh, demo and then maybe end with uh, a couple of demos on actually running YOLO V8 in real time on some camera streams. And finally show if there is still time a demo of our cloud compiler so that you can just bring your PyTorch checkpoint and get a ready to serve model in under five minutes, basically. So the main focus today is going to be on YOLO V8 models, how to deploy and make applications on edge devices, uh, essentially with no PyTorch dependence. So how can we get into a very small library that can run these models? Uh, we made a one minute summary video, which I can, uh, I will share the slides after the meeting just to show what, uh, what we have. Uh, we previously had some webinars on how to quantize YOLO models and how to basically, uh, all the concepts that I talked about, why there is loss in quantization, how to do, how to design models that are more quant friendly. And we also talked about this in the Ultralytics YOLO vision uh, in September. So our talk is there also. So these are some resources that people can use to uh, see our previous work. Uh, before we start, you can sign up for our Delight Cloud platform uh, so that you can run the demos by yourself. You can scan the QR code and you can just sign up using uh, your Gmail or GitHub or using your email address. Um, we also have a Google Collab notebook. Uh, for today, I have provided a temporary token so that you people don't, uh, if they don't have time to register and generate the token, they can directly use the notebook to run some of the demos that we are talking about. So just a quick overview of Digiram. I promise not to do a marketing pitch. We are, uh, we are a provider of hardware and software formed about six years ago, uh, still growing. And uh, as Glenn mentioned, we have uh, basically uh, three main products. We have a hardware, which we call Orca, which is an AI hardware, hardware accelerator for edge inference. We have a cloud platform called Delight, and we have a software called PySDK that uh, helps uh, people develop applications uh, on this platform and hardware. On the hardware side, uh, I won't bore you with all the details and performance numbers, but uh, just in terms that everybody here in the talk can understand, you can think that it will support about four cameras uh, for YOLO V8 N and V5 NU type of models, and about two cameras for YOLO V8 S and YOLO V5 SU type of models. Uh, you can run multiple models at the same time. Uh, switching penalty is very less. We have support for prune models, and we have uh, the hardware available in ASIC, M.2, and USB form factors. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on hardware, but just move to our cloud platform. Basically, the reason we built our cloud platform is that um, uh, bringing up hardware and testing models on the hardware is a very long process. So we wanted to provide people with uh, access to AI hardware accelerators in the cloud. So basically through your PC, you can access uh, 
Coral Edge TPU, our Orca, Intel CPU, GPU. Future, we may even add uh, NVIDIA Jetson type of devices. This way, you don't have to make any upfront investment on hardware. Start your development in a couple of minutes. And also use the platform to compile models for different hardware in the cloud. So basically take your PyTorch checkpoint and get it into a format that uh, runs on these devices in a single click, including optimization steps such as uh, quantization. So this will allow you to basically get some immediate performance estimation of the model on the target hardware. And then uh, we have the concept of Cloud Zoo where you can just put these compiled models in the zoo and then serve them uh, very quickly. And finally, uh, we are working in the future to even include uh, collecting and labeling data so that there is a unified platform that supports all of these uh, model development in one place. The platform and the hardware are supported by our uh, Pi SDK. So that's actually one of the main things that I wanted to talk uh, about today is a simple and intuitive API that works with multiple hardware options. So once we made something for our hardware, a lot of customers were asking, uh, can we make it for other hardware also so that they can use our software on different hardware? And we started making uh, efforts along those directions. So whatever code you see here, this uh, after importing, these are the only four lines of code you need to know. So basically the first line allows you to develop in the cloud and deploy at the edge. So you connect to a model zoo. The hardware can be in the cloud. It can be in a local AI server, or it can be on the machine that you are running the application. And you just need to change one single line in the code to go from cloud to the local. After you connect to the model zoo, you basically load a model. And here, basically, we have a single software that supports multiple hardware options. So we have integrated our own runtime N2X and other runtimes such as OpenVINO, TensorRT, TensorFlow Lite, ONNX runtime in a transparent way so that when you load a model, you just basically specify which runtime it is running and on which device it is running. And then uh, the underlying software will basically take care of uh, running it on the uh, required hardware. So basically this gives you uh, the flexibility and compatibility to basically design just one software and address all the hardware options. We have a very simple uh, model running API. Inference API is just uh, results equal to model of input and we take care of everything from input decoding to resizing it to the size expected by the model, pre-processing it, running the ML inference, doing the post-processing and resizing back to the output, uh, to the input size. And no more uh, boilerplate code to actually see the outputs of different ML models. So if you have a classification, it will give you labels. If you have detection, it will give you bounding boxes. It will, if you have segmentation, it will give you the uh, segmented contours. So that's a very quick overview of uh, what we offer. Uh, with that, I want to say that uh, we are happy today to say that we trained in the last few months, 40 different models. So apart from Coco, we used the uh, hands, faces, cars, and license plates from Google Open Images. Uh, these five data sets, four model variations. So YOLO V8 actually has four, um, uh, actually supports YOLO V5, but trained on YOLO V8. So we have V5 NU, SU. We also have V8N and V8S. Uh, and for two different activation functions, CILU and uh, RELU6. And we have seen extremely good results uh, for each of these models. So all of them are available on our uh, fork. You can get their checkpoints and you can run your own uh, experiments. So with this, I would like to move to the demo part where again, I will show how you can run all of these models very quickly uh, and then Hopefully, we hope that the community will build some very cool applications on top of this, as well as uh, take this work further and make even more models on top of this.
So the first demo, okay. I great, Tashi. So I love Colab myself. It's uh, the best, simplest way to get started with Python. I think. So the first demo I wanted to show was actually what we call. Uh, The first demo I wanted to show was uh, the Alteralytics V6 Zoo. So as I mentioned, uh, the 40 models, we have them working on Orca, which is our test chip, Orca 1, our production chip, HTPU, which is the Google Corel HTPU, and uh, CPU. We have both float and quant on OpenVINO. So basically 40 models, five different uh, variations. So you can see that this model zoo basically has uh, 200 different uh, models. You can pick any model. So let's say we pick the car detector and then just pick an image. You can run the inference and you'll see the results. So, and as I said, the code is essentially four lines of code. Uh, not only that, you can actually see the time it takes to run. So the inference duration is 34 milliseconds on CPU. So which means that you can actually get these uh, models on running real time on your uh, CPU. Uh, you can choose HTPU. So basically the same, the same model, you can run it on HTPU. And you see that the performance is very impressive, 13.2 milliseconds. So, so basically, this means that this can run about uh, 70, 75 frames per. So, Shashi, where are these HTPUs then that you're running on right now? Sorry. Glenn, can you repeat your question? Uh, where are these edge TPUs that you're running the demo on right now? Ah, so we actually have a cloud. Yeah, uh, yeah. sorry, I think form. there's a little bit of a delay here. Uh, it's the first time we've set up with StreamYard, but I was asking about the edge TPUs, like where you said you're running on them. Ah, yes. So we have a farm of devices in our uh, cloud. So we maintain devices that have our accelerator, edge TPU, and uh, OpenVINO CPU and GPU in our cloud. So when you connect to the model zoo and run the inference, the requests are routed to our cloud farm. So these are real edge TPUs uh, hosted by us. Okay. So as you can see, edge TPUs can run <laughs> Uh, 640 so it's, uh, by six. edge device, but it's in the cloud. So you're saying? Yes, yes. <laughs> so that uh, people can actually test that things are working uh, before they make any commitment to the hardware or to the or to the model. So. So we can run again the same model on Orca. So this is our uh, our accelerator. So as you can see, uh, gives about uh, 110 frames per uh, second or so, as I mentioned, four camera streams, uh, real time camera streams on these type of uh, models. So the, the in-browser inference is a very quick way for people to get uh, started to see what is uh, available, how they work, what is roughly the performance of each of these uh, models. Uh, and we have a lot of other uh, public zoos. As you can see, we have uh, YOLO V5. Uh, we have our public model zoo. We have OpenVINO, a bunch of these model zoos that uh, help people to kickstart their uh, development. Uh, the in-browser inference is uh, quick to get started, but actually doesn't give you a lot of freedom to do what you want. So the next demo I want to do is to actually show how you can do with the Google Colab. 
So I hope that people who are seeing the demo, they can run this uh, demo by themselves. Uh, the code, as you can see, is extremely simple. In Colab, you just uh, install, install the Digirem uh, Python package. And then you, for today, I provided a token. This is only valid for today. For <laughs> So we have, for today I have provided a token so that uh, if you don't have time to register and generate your own token, you can just play around with this. So again, you can load the model, you can run the images and see the results here. Uh, you can list the models to see the list of all the 200 models that we have in the, in the zoo. Hmm. And you can play around. So you can uh, change this uh, Coco to, let's say, from N2X, you can change it to OpenVINO. And instead of ARCA1, you can say CPU. And basically, you will get, you will get, uh, you, you can run okay, this. So Shashi, you can... you're saying that the you define a model here from the zoo, but it's got the edge device in the file name, or at least in the argument name, and yes. that's going to run that on that edge device? Yes. So basically, we have a model configuration that, uh, that basically knows that this model, when you load, uh, oh. This model, when you load, it knows that it is uh, targeted towards OpenVINO and towards CPU because each model has its own binary. So OpenVINO runs ONNX, uh, TensorRT will run some engine file, uh, HTPU will run some compiled uh, TF Lite file, uh, ARCA will run its own N2X file. So this is kind of the model name encapsulates this configuration so that the appropriate binary is uh, loaded. So you can... Okay, it's very cool. Then you can actually run the same model, but with different backends or these different export formats so you can profile them, compare yeah. how they perform on the picture and the speeds and so on. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the aims of the platform is that uh, people, when they change their hardware, they don't have to change their software. So mm -hmm. they can use this to develop one software stack. And then depending on, because hardware decision is a quite complicated uh, process. So it is dependent on many factors, but uh, they cannot develop one software for every hardware and then make the decision at the end because this will take too much of their uh, time and effort. This way they can just have one software, they see which one works, uh, pick whatever they like. Uh, so the collab is, as Glenn mentioned, collab is kind of a quick way to get started, uh, to play around with the models, see uh, how they look, how many models are there, how they work on different uh, images and uh, so on. Uh, the last demo that I want to show is a little bit more complicated, but uh, more realistic in a sense that how do you start developing applications on top of the YOLO type of models? So basically uh, this uses our PySDK, but it will be running uh, locally. So for this, you need to have the PySDK software, uh, which again, towards the end, I will provide all of these links. But the main idea here is that you can run uh, essentially the same code in the cloud. So you can write your own applications without having the hardware. You can specify the target as DG cloud. And then we have a simple function called predict stream that will take the model name and the camera ID. So the camera can be 
a webcam that is attached to your computer it can be an rtsp stream it can be a video file it can be a youtube file so let me show a quick example where we are running um, where we are basically running a so here we are running i have a rtsp stream uh, camera here in my in my room so i connect it and i basically say run yolo v8 and relu6 uh, coco model on on this one and as you can see this is running through the cloud uh, and this is the only code that you have to do so is detecting that i'm a person Hmm. And uh, Shashi, where can everybody get the links to these notebooks and so on? This is probably what you're asking about at the beginning, right? Yeah. So the the notebook links are uh, the PySDK uh, links. I will provide at the end of the slide. So I'll I'll share with everybody. Uh, we have a GitHub repository that. Uh, has all of these examples that people can immediately run. Right, so Pi SDK is a separate Python package in addition to Digirum. Yeah, Digirum is, right? is the Pi SDK. So the code that you have seen import Digirum as DG, that is our uh, Pi SDK, our Python software development kit. Oh, it is. OK. It just, okay. So you can run, uh, as okay, I said, you can. It. Yeah, it's a little confused there. You can run it on a video. So and you can even run it on uh, YouTube URLs. So gives you like, you know, very good uh, uh, freedom to write applications the way the way you want. Uh, and finally, like this I want, <laughs> finally, I want to show one demo of uh, how you can run multiple uh, models. So here we have a hand detection model uh, that's based on YOLO V8N. We have a face detection model also based on V8N and a Coco model that's uh, also V810. And what you can do is we have the notion of a compound model that basically combines all of these uh, models and you can run predict stream on the, on the combined uh, model. Uh, so since I'm using the same webcam for my stream yard, uh, this wouldn't work, but the, code is, as you can see, is going to be extremely uh, simple like this. I can share the PySDK examples uh, here in the chat so that everybody. OK, that's a great walk through, Shashi. Yeah, sharing the links would be great. I think for the notebooks, also the, I think the delight page that you mentioned, you had a QR there, but I couldn't see the URL. Yeah, so. So towards the end, we have all the, all the resources that we will be sharing. Uh, if, uh, if anyone from Digirum is there on the YouTube chat, maybe you people can help me out by posting in the comments all of these actual URL links. Maybe people cannot uh, click them here, but we have a PySDK examples GitHub repository. We have a cloud platform, the Delight. 
we have a discourse community for uh, support we have a youtube channel with all the demos and uh, with all the demos that we have and we have the digital analytics uh, fork Okay, perfect. Okay, guys, uh, let's see. So let me say that uh, if anybody has any questions about anything, uh, definitely drop them here in the chat, in the YouTube chat, and we will get to those uh, pretty soon here. So I see some people have already asked a few questions and I see some of these are for you, Shashi. So Let's see, people have been asking uh, about access to the OCR model in the zoo and also stats for the CPU that the cloud examples that you showed are running on. Yeah, so the OCR model is in our uh, public model zoo, so people can uh, access it. We will, uh, again, if somebody from Digirum is there, if they can post it, uh, but yeah it is there but it is only for license plates so that means it is not a general ocr model it cannot uh, it has been trained specifically to extract license plate type of things from uh, a license plate so if the license plate has the state and other things it is trained to ignore those so it is not a general ocr model that you can basically take any picture and do it it is one specific purpose um the second question was about the CPU. So the CPU models are run on uh, what we call an Intel NUC. So this is a standard core i3 type of things. And as you can see, the performance is uh, really impressive. Uh, but of course, this is kind of what we call like a benchmark performance. Uh, CPU performance is not like other hardware accelerators because hardware accelerators are dedicated resources for running ML models. So you will basically see that performance all the time but for cpu it is a very complex function of what other applications are running so because it's a shared resource uh, right now the way we run is um, yeah so right now the way we run is just as an ai server so it doesn't have any other uh, any other load so I see some comments. Uh... Okay. Okay. Let's see. Uh, we've got a couple other questions that have popped up here. Uh, just, yeah. Let's see. Just last one. Uh, ah. Ram Kumar asked, which model is suitable for Raspberry Pi? I think a so... new model Raspberry Pi just came out, Pi 5. It's got some upgraded hardware. But uh, what do you think, Shashi? So, Raspberry Pi, we. Uh, we are working uh, to get a USB uh, working with Raspberry Pi. So we got the HTPU YOLO V8 working on Raspberry Pi with uh, Google HTPU. Soon we will have our own Orca. So if somebody is interested in this, I think this is one very good thing to check out. Uh, I see one question. Uh, Somebody asking if we are still working on the pull request. Okay. Uh, and uh, regarding quantization performance. Yeah. yeah. So we have we have the fork that uh, allows uh, people to uh, export this. Yes. Yes, I can take that, Shashi. So. Yeah. Yep. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go go ahead. I'm sorry, guys. I got to apologize to everybody. There's uh, there's a big delay here. Uh, I think this is the first time we've used StreamYard, and we're still getting it set up a little bit. But but let me let me just go ahead and take this then. So so yes, uh, there's uh, a lot of things that the the team is uh, delayed on at Ultralytics. So we're a, we're a small team. We're growing quickly. 
uh, but we're still only about 15 people. And so we are trying to cover all the bases here. We've got a public roadmap uh, that is just in the Ultralytics project under the organization. It's called YOLO and it has a number of different tasks. Uh, uh, the, the main ones that we're putting effort into are additional tasks to support things like oriented bounding boxes, uh, support for improved classification models and so on. So the pull request is definitely in the roadmap. Um, it's in a queue and we're trying to work through it as fast as we can. Yeah. Uh, let's see, there's, there's a really interesting question here, by the way, by, uh, let's see, Jordan Renon. He says, is there any research or support for including auxiliary non-image information in model inputs? Uh, so I don't think I've gotten this question before. Like typically what happens is you may want to add values to inference outputs. Uh, like for a person, you might not just want to detect the box, but you may want to say regress and age for them. Uh, or sex, male or female, uh, perhaps something like sentiment. Um, but for model inputs, this is uh, a little more difficult. I wouldn't say adding an output is trivial because you need labeled data, obviously, for that. You need to add it to the loss function and uh, so on. But on the input side, uh, what we have is a convolution neural network that is uh, very good at iterating uh, over the width and height of an image and uh, sequentially reducing that to a feature vector. So the X, Y dimensions get squeezed down and the color, the channel dimension gets elongated to store more information. This doesn't lend itself directly to adding other types of information to the image. Uh, so in this type of setting, what you would do is you would use the output of the YOLO model combined with additional metadata that you may have, things like camera, location, uh, that may assist in more downstream types of estimation tasks. And that could be with classical estimation techniques, uh, or it could be with a, a, maybe like a shallow machine learning model that might be able to do something like that for you. So uh, ML is an interesting field in that there's a number of different ways to attack the problem. Just like if you use Google Maps, you can get to dinner uh, any number of different ways. And with a type of problem like this, there's also multiple different solutions, but I feel like something that uh, is a cascaded detector, sort of like the OCR example on the license plate that Shashi was talking about is probably the right approach there. So uh, let me see, we've got a couple other ones too. Let's see, Vivek Malvi, I haven't read this question yet. He says, what type of machine is suitable for running eight RTSP streams on Yolo V8? Oh, well, okay, so the Ultralytics package has built in parallelization for streams like RTSP. And this means that uh, you can do this very simply if you have the hardware to support it. <laughs> so, which is what your question is about. Um, and there's no there's no right answer here because the, the answer is that this is gonna work at some image size on any computer, even a Raspberry Pi. So it really depends on your application and sort of like the minimum threshold for accuracy that you're looking for. Um, if you're trying to run, say, like a default scenario, say eight cameras at 640, you could probably run that pretty simply with a, a T4 GPU, just a batch size eight. Um, I'm not sure if it'll be real time, but of course you can play around with the, the image dimension with optimization. You definitely know, want to run on tensor IT and so on. <clears throat> okay, let's see here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anybody else, if you've got any questions, just drop them here. I'll, I'll try and attack them. I get a lot of questions about Raspberry Pis. So fun fact is I've never actually used one myself. I'm a MacBook guy, so I, uh, I haven't plugged one in and started playing around with it, but I feel like I should. Raspberry Pis, Jetson Nanos, Edge TPUs, like you mentioned, Shashi, I think uh, uh, are something that I see a lot, but I I personally haven't used some. Shashi, uh, what do you think is, uh, I guess like one of the main challenges uh in the work that you do like when you discretize these models like what do uh i guess the users typically ask of you or what do they complain about the most yeah the the biggest uh, complaint is actually you know people are always on the lookout for good models uh even with all the resources uh, available uh, everybody's use case is slightly different so they want uh, so we have kind of moved beyond just recognition or detection so people now want to have tracking. 
or uh, <laughs> some kind of time information so you know like one example would be that oh can you find can you find an unidentified object uh, lying around somewhere right so <laughs> there is no such model for that like you have to have some time information whether people are interacting with the object or not right like you know can you find uh, if a if a bike has been left in a parking lot for more than 3 days right so you know of course you can build such a thing but there is no direct model for that so what we are saying is that um, going from going from models to real applications so there are some some challenges so how to use this information of time uh and track this and make some analytics on on top of this yeah it's really interesting it it is like you said it is all about creating the solution and the models and the discretization the hardware they're just one piece of the puzzle one link in the chain so it's up to uh, the ML developers and the solutions architects to put those puzzle pieces together into something that actually provides value. It's all part of the fun. So guys, uh, let's see here. It looks like we are coming up on time here. Uh, I think there's like one or two more questions. Let's see, okay, I'll, I'll take one more question. Let's see, Vladimir Radnovich says, can it run an ARM two core plus Intel OpenVINO inside camera? So, uh, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, Shashi, but I think I'm going to venture that this is really one of those questions that you just have to try it and see what the result is. Typically in science, that's called uh, an empirical type of experiment, which means that the, the answer that you get is just the right answer. So uh, yeah, and this is something about ML. I think there's, there's theory, but I think a lot of the field is just getting your hands dirty, trying it out and seeing what works and what doesn't because oftentimes uh, it's just all about experimentation about failing falling down eight times and getting up nine times and uh, taking it forward so okay uh well all right so thank you for joining us shashi and uh providing some expertise here on the deployment, on the discretization and optimization quantization side. And uh, if anybody has any questions and any topics we didn't cover here, you know, feel free to raise those issues on the Ultralytics repo or on the Dejiren repos. And we'll try and answer them there. And uh, happy trainings and happy deployments, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Glenn. Thank you for all the great work on the YOLO V5 and YOLO V8. We truly believe that this class of models will be the ones that will be most widely used in uh, deployment, at least from what uh, we are seeing. So. Great guys. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you everyone.